Cozy clothes seem to be the in thing. Whether it's your favorite pair of sweatpants or a t-shirt, or it's a bulky sweater and leggings. Either way, it's the comfort of not having to look fashionable or really presentable. This is cozy clothes. But in an era where everything seems so put together, structured, and fashionable with fancy societal norms, let's say the Victorian era, what did they consider as cozy clothes? Like, what did they slip into when they weren't in the eyes of fashionable peers? And most importantly, what did they wear on Christmas morning? Two items of clothing seem to be the most relevant to this discussion, one being a wrapper and the other a tea gown. The wrapper was seen as something to quickly throw on before you got fully dressed, whether that was with wearing a corset or without a corset. Either way, it was just a comfy, first, top-of-the-morning outfit. The garment was only meant for the eyes of intimate family members. As for the tea gown, it was a step up from the wrapper, a bit more formal, but still something you would never wear in the public eye, or it might be the gossip for the rest of the year. Of course, looking at these garments, it appears to be more appropriate for like a black tie event in our era, but to the Victorians who dressed to impress, followed fashion norms, and lived in an era that they did, this was their way of dressing down, cozying up, and enjoying a relaxing spell away from the eyes of proper fashion. As you might have guessed, it's now time to actually enter the world of Victorian cozy clothes and bring one to life. For me, what did they wear on Christmas morning project? I have chosen to make a tea gown. This dress will be made out of brown wool, trimmed with silk velvet, and have a section of pleated cotton gauze in the front. That definitely sounds more like a black tie dress than a cozy clothes, but it's Victorian, remember. The pattern is from a book published in 1888 and is currently located in the internet archive and can be accessed for free. The link will of course be in the description below. I've chosen to alter the pattern slightly in order to create a Watteau back on this gown. There's a healthy mix of this style in tea gowns, in fashion drawings and such. So I decided to add it because I think it adds a little bit of a unique touch to this gown. And a huge thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. The first and most important part of the project is to create a mock-up of the pattern. After two mock-ups, I achieved a fit that was correct and comfortable. I then could cut the mock-up apart to access the final pattern. Since my wool fabric is lightweight, I've chosen to interline it with a homespun cotton. This type of fabric can be a bit stretchy and might not prove to be the best use of it, but I wanted to use a more fun lining than just a basic muslin, and so that is why I chose to use this, and we're gonna just go for it and hope it works. Since my mock-up and thus pattern only goes to my hips, I need to lengthen them to create the skirt. The skirt shape is fairly basic, but to make sure it's all cut correctly, I'm first going to cut all of the pieces out of my interlining. Another reason for doing it this way is so I can play around with the placement of the pieces on my wool. I only have four yards of the wool, and I really need five to six, so I'm really pushing it here. But I was fairly confident that with some finagling and flip-flopping, I could make it work. My wool doesn't have a noticeable nap, nor is one side different than the other, so this means I can definitely do some flip-flopping of the pieces to arrange them as tightly as possible. It did take me nearly an hour to arrange the pieces, and I will have two extra seams in the skirt, but having to use the fabric in the most efficient way is really perfect for this cozy clothes project because, you know, who wants to spend extra money on cozy clothes? So now it's time to start assembling. So interlining means to treat the lining fabric and the outer fabric as one along the entire process. This means I first need to align each individual pattern piece to its corresponding interlining and then base them together. 
As I'm doing this, I am using the roll pinning technique in order to allow the extra room that the outer fabric needs. To create the Watteau pleats, I'll be sewing the center back seam first. As you can see, there's extra width to this piece, and I'm also sewing the seam with the wrong sides together, which is incorrect for a usual seam. But for this process, the extra width needs to be on the outside of the gown, and it will also get pleated up to create those pleats. And the rest of the pattern is a fairly straightforward assembly process. about this video's sponsor. On those days when you just need something to pick you up at dinner time, something that's delicious but also easy and fast, HelloFresh is the perfect answer. With so many meal choices, you can not only have the comfort of familiar flavors, but you can also branch out and try new and unique meals, all while knowing it will be packed full of flavor and freshness. So especially in this time, going to the grocery store is a bit of a hassle and time draining, but with HelloFresh being delivered to your door, you can save all that time and stress and have more time for creativity, which is what we all want, right? Not only can you quickly adjust your meals and how frequently they get delivered, but you can also prepare your meals knowing that HelloFresh is committed to sustainability by using eco-friendly packaging. Personally, preparing the meal was quite fun and I really love trying new recipes, so all in all, it was great. It honestly felt like going out to eat once it was all prepared, which is a real treat. Go to HelloFresh.com and use my code 80BELLA to get $80 off across 5 boxes, including free shipping on your first box. Again, go to HelloFresh.com and use my code 80BELLA and get $80 off across five boxes and free shipping on your first box. Thank you again to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. The meal was absolutely delicious. And this is so exciting because it pretty much never snows in Arkansas, maybe a few times each winter, but it is snowing and wouldn't it be amazing to get shots in this amazing snowy condition? I mean, ultimate photo shoot location and environment. But as you know, my dress is kind of not finished and is really not even wearable yet. But 
I am crazy enough to try and get it wearable by the end of today to get some shots in this freshly fallen snow. Yes, it's crazy and we will see how it actually turns out, but maybe, maybe it'll actually happen. So before I can get started really on getting the velvet attached to my lapels and which I guess, what is that called? I don't know. But anyway, the hole from up here down to here is going to be covered with my silk velvet. Um, and it's just, my piece goes like this and then it flips over and is creating this entire, um, I don't know what it's called. Would it be considered a lapel if it like starts up there and then continues down to the bottom? I don't know, but whatever. We're gonna just call it the lapel. I am pretty sure that this whole part needs some whole horsehair canvas in it um, just to keep it more stiff and staying folded out. But then I actually just referenced um, one of Bernadette Banner's video about reconstructing her coat and she uses um, horsehair canvas going from like this whole front piece and kind of curves in and goes all the way down and her coat doesn't turn out like this. Um, but I think I'm going to do the same like similar thing where the horsehair will I don't know where it's gonna actually start, but it'll be on the lapel part as well as underneath it to kind of just have a nice stiff edge where it curves and just give more stability to this whole front instead of just the lapel turned out part, if that makes sense. So I think I have to go do that and we'll see what happens. So if any of you watching know tailoring and working with horse there, you're probably looking at me and going, what in the world are you doing? And the answer is, I have no idea. I am just playing around with the horse hair and the pattern and seeing what happens. So what I was doing in that little video was um, lining up my horse hair to the edge. And then I kind of worked in the dart that I have in my pattern and kind of created that um, round look that you often see in tailoring with horsehair on the um, breast area of a tailored garment. And I kind of just worked that into the pattern by, yeah, as you saw, I just kind of snipped away. And then that little seam there, which is just gonna be laid like that and um, stitch in place is right where the dart is. So I think it might be okay just to do that. I have no idea if this is the right way to do it, but hey, we're gonna see if it works. And then I haven't pinned down there yet, but it's pretty basic um, drape. So I think it'll, I think it'll help just everything stay folded. I have no idea, but yeah. So there, now I have to cut the second side and then pin it all back in place and then I guess do pad stitching. As for the pad stitching technique and well, honestly everything having to do with using horsehair canvas because I've never used it before. I again referenced my favorite sewing book and the lovely Bernadette. After that little intermission of research, I think I acquired the correct techniques for tackling this process, but we shall find out. I first overlapped the edges of the dart and overlaid a piece of linen tape to contain that rough edge. Thank you. 
after doing that, I could align the canvas to the dress. Now here's where it's incredibly important to use the roll pinning technique when working with this canvas. This basically means moving and folding the fabric as it will fall on the body. As I'm lining all of the layers up, I'm creating the curves and the folds of the bodice, which will help the canvas lay in the perfect spot to do its job. the first row of pad stitching is to be placed on the fold of the lapel or whatever is being folded, which in my case is an incredibly long piece. But after that, the rows and the stitches continue to the outer edge. So I just spent about two hours doing that pad stitching and it actually goes surprisingly fast. I was kind of shocked by how fast I was able to get a line done all the way from the top to the very bottom of the dress, but there's just a lot of lines that need to be done. And considering the light is already fading, I was thinking that there's kind of no way and there really isn't, but I realized that I actually don't have to do all the pad stitching to make it like wearable looking finished, if that makes sense. But anyway, the snow is still coming down and I'm hoping that it stays around till tomorrow because I think I could get it done by tomorrow um, and then get some nice shots in the snow still, so if it decides to stick around. But anyway, the reason why I was thinking I had to do all the pad stitching was because the velvet is going to go on top of this section here. And so I figured that's covering this all up which means I have to get the inside, aka the pad stitching, all finished before putting on the velvet. But I realized that when I sew on the velvet to this lapel, I am going to machine stitch it here, um, right sides together like you usually do, turn it over, and then you get the velvet on top with all the raw edges turned in on itself. But then there'd be one raw edge here of the velvet that needs to get tacked down. And I was planning to do hand sewing to get that final edge of the lapel velvet tacked down and all that, but then I realized I can just leave that one edge of velvet unsewn. It's gonna be hidden under here and I can just pin it in place for like photos, let's say. And that means that when I'm done with photos, I can just peel it back open, finish the pad stitching and then re-close the velvet and do that final seam if that makes sense. So I don't actually have to finish all the pad stitching to move on to the next step. So for right now, there's a few lines here on this side and then a couple lines on this side, but I'm gonna go on to the velvet cutting and see what happens. But as you can see, actually, you can already tell that the lapel and all the way down at the skirt is already folding correctly, just with those few lines of pad stitching. So anyway. Pretty happy with it, and on to the velvet we go. When cutting the velvet, the nap is incredibly important. No flip-flopping and rearranging really the pieces on this piece of fabric because the nap needs to be on the same direction for both pieces. So this silk velvet doesn't have a lot of structure to it and it's fairly flimsy. So to stiffen it up a bit, I've chosen to interface it with silk organza. And then of course the organza and the velvet need to be carefully basted together.
After all this pre-work, I can finally attach the velvet to the wool. It's finally starting to come together. I'm so excited. After doing that, I also tidied up the neckline with some canvas for stability and then faced it with some of the wool fabric. I did on cuffs and I got the pieces cut out and I thought I'd share what I'm doing inside the cuffs. So I did um, interline it with some silk organza, the, the velvet, because it definitely needs some stability to it. And then I added some horsehair um, canvas in there and I did a cross hatch just into the silk organza. And then I also did it up at the top too um, but I already did the next step so you can't see it. But after that, I then folded the seam allowances all down and did a catch stitch to secure that end all in place. So that's what I, that's what's inside each cuff. So this is the center front white piece here. The back is just a plain piece of muslin and I just draped the shape of what it needed to be on the dress form just based on where the um, wool dress ended. And then it just kind of, it will attach to the shoulder seams, attach along the side and then, and then on the front side, I cut my gauzy type fabric um, quite a bit larger in the center so I had room to make all these pleats. So I got it pleated along the neckline and then also at the waist and then it will hang free going down the skirt. And so just that under muslin piece will first of all keep this from being um, sheer because the gauze is pretty sheer and then it keeps all the pleats together and everything. And so what is the closure of this dress? One side will be sewn to the um, main part of the dress, the wool part. And then this side will have hooks and eyes and it will connect underneath that wool side. So there won't be a center front opening. It'll be along the side. And then the hooks and eyes are probably gonna start, you know, past hip line. So I have enough room to get into the dress. And then along the neckline, there's this little frilly bit along the neck. And I originally cut my gauze long enough to create that, but I've decided that I want it to go all the way around the neck. So I'm actually just gonna trim that back and create a separate little piece that'll attach all around the neckline. And there's going to be a little strip of velvet that goes around the neckline as well. try on. It is very good. I like it. Um, so what's left is I need to do the belt and then the collar thing. Um, and then it'll be wearable enough to maybe get some quick shots. And then I'll spend the rest of the day finishing it up, like doing the pad stitching and everything. And then hoping that the snow sticks around until tomorrow and I can get finished finished shots with it um, because it's going to be very makeshift if I do a quick shoot today um, because there's also the hem to do but it looks wearable so that'll work for now I really like the velvet lapel stuff
Now, I realized I made my collar piece way too large. I was basing it on the neckline of my dress, but the neckline is bigger than where my neck lays. And I was originally thinking that because the velvet edge would be sewn to the wool dress and then I needed to make it the correct measurement. But then I realized it would probably look better if this was kind of just a separate piece, like it looked like a separate piece and the neck of the dress kind of just like, you know, laid around here. So you got some white peeking out beneath the velvet as well as above, if that makes sense. So I just put a little knot in it to make it smaller and I actually really like the look. So I didn't have to adjust the piece and it adds a little character. So now I'm just gonna pin that together and then I guess I have to hand sew it. And with a whole lot of pins holding everything together, literally everything, I ventured out into the cold for a quick little video shoot. After that little adventure, some unpinning was needed to gain access to that unfinished pad stitching, which then took all evening to finish up. It may not be the most even pad stitching in the world, but with it being my first time and the amount of it that needed to be done, I call it a huge success. And honestly, I can't wait to do my next pad stitching adventure. I think I've completely fallen in love with the beauty of the stitch and the canvas and what it does to create the shape of the garment is just like magic. And now it's time to permanently finish up these velvet sections. I'm first using a catch stitch to secure the velvet edge in place. One more step to cleaning up the inside is a piece of lining to cover up that canvas. The canvas is pretty rough, so you don't really want that visible, even if it's on the inside. The outer edge of this lining piece is simply catch stitched right next to the velvet edge, and then I placed a piece of binding to cover up both those raw edges, and I just used a fell stitch securing both those binding edges. After that, there's just one more edge to finish up here in the inside of the dress, and I've just folded the raw edge under itself and used a fell stitch to secure it in place. 
So a great advantage to my little unfinished video shoot was the fact that I got to see some details that I really wasn't that happy with. One of them being the neck ruff. It was just a bit too big and bulky and just really not my thing. But I originally made it out of double thick gauze fabric and pleated it, but this time around I'm just using a single layer of the fabric. I then gathered it and then I had to also shorten the velvet band. But after that it was much more my style. Now onto the hems. For the white fabric, I chose to do a quick rolled hem. Imagine that, I decided to do something quickly. And I machine sewed it in place. For the wool edge, I chose to use a bias cut facing out of Silk Dupioni. The color is a bit, um, well, not matching, but it's the only thing that I had in stock that could really do the job well. Now here's where I could insert a few scenes of peacefully hand sewing the hem. But the truth is, I don't have any, because it didn't happen. I have a deadline for this video, and I needed to have an actual finished video shoot by the evening, so instead I did a mad job of basting the facing in place with extremely large stitches. The basting will eventually come out, and it will get re-sewn in place with some tiny stitches, hopefully. This is where I should also show the process of attaching the white front section to the dress, and placing the hooks and eyes and clasps and everything that will keep this all together. But this is also non-existent at this time and place. to my brother for helping with the videography of the finished product and then also to my mom for helping me get this project done in time and then of course a huge shout out to all my patrons who make this journey possible now if you guys like a little bit of victorian themed music videos 
and also just original Christmas songs, then I highly recommend you going and checking out Florence Street Band. This is not sponsored by them, it's just simply I love their music so much, and in order for them to keep creating wonderful music, they need more views and listeners. So if that could be you, check out that link and give it a listen. I think you'll find a little more magic in the Christmas season with their song playing in the background. Again, thank you all for watching and thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video.